Are we ready to get started? Yay! Yeah. I think the first thing we should do is go around and just give an introduction, and then we can hop right in. Um, so my name is Eva Balin. I currently work for The Graph, and I've worked on Moloch DAO um, and also been associated with the DAO sector for about a year now. I'm James Duncan, uh, former EF Grants, now with Abridged, focused on UX and DAO ops. Uh, I'm Suji and founder of Dimension, uh, one of a product called MathBook. And you probably heard my speech early this morning about how to um, use MathBook to, to hack, you know, let it hack on Facebook. And I've been working in the DAO area like for like one and a half year. Yeah. Hi, I'm Zephyr Liu. Uh, I work on Betoken, which is a decentralized crypto hedge fund. I also work on Fantastic, sorry, Fantastic 12, which allows you to turn any Discord channel into a DAO. My name is Eric. I work at DAO Stack, uh, mainly on DAO design. So today we're going to talk about um, bots and DAOs and uh, how that whole space and just explore some questions. And we're going to try to make it inclusive. It's a fairly small group. So if you guys have questions, just shout it out. Could I, could I just start and ask? So uh, remind me. Uh, can you pronounce your name again? Or what your name? Suji. 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 And what what was the project? You said it was a Facebook mask. Mask book. Yeah, it's a mask on Facebook. Okay, cool. It's a it's a mask on on Facebook. It replaced the word face with a mask, you know. And the logo of us is from the anime um, Ghost in the Shell. Oh. So it's a little bit mask and all of our words from the Quote from J.D. Salinger, uh, what, I, what, I uh, what I pretend I was doing is what I pretend I was like uh, one of the deaf mute from the Catching the Ray, last chapter. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's uh, like our personal interest of the, like the, the, this, this ideology and DAOs. The thing it does is uh, it's a plugin on Brother and also a mobile app that everything you put on Facebook, Twitter uh, for a post or for a tweet will be encrypted into gibberish. And then only your friends will see your private key or will see your content with your DID can only uh, able to decrypt that. And uh, early, uh, like early, not early this year, uh, early this lunar year, so which is last week, um, Chinese New Year, we partnered with MakerDAO to send red packet over Twitter and over Facebook. So which means you can not only send um, encrypted gibberish, encrypted image, you can also send uh, cryptocurrency or whatever cryptocurrency or whatever, uh, smart contract over Twitter and Facebook. And um, also WeChat, yeah. Actually, that's a good point. We should probably just make a quick intro. Sweet. Yeah, well, cool. On, on I, I wanted to understand on. because uh, that was the first I've actually heard of MassBook. Yeah. So I would love to. I did hear about the Red Packet uh, uh, thing with Maker, though. So that's really cool. Um, so what I'm, what I abridged, what we're kind of like, why we're here, why we're focused, why we're on the stage for DAO chats. Um, we have been really thinking hard about how to get people onboarded into Web2 for um, more than a year now. Uh, we also have been extremely involved and, and, uh, and engaged in the DAO communities, specifically Meta Cartel and the Moloch communities. Um, I've also have a lot of friends and like been deeply, I don't know, involved with the Genesis DAO as well as um, uh, Aragon, etc. cetera. Um, and so for, from our perspective, uh, we've been thinking about how to bring the tech to existing platforms that have uh, communities already uh, exist, like that, that are already uh, active. And uh, so the first iteration and, and, and what we kind of uh, think about here is DAO ops. So rather than with DevOps, you're able to spin up applications that are resistant to uh, bandwidth constraints. With DAO ops, you're able to spin up DAOs and operating systems for DAOs uh, to reduce um, human coordination cost, as well as friction for the users and the members of these DAOs to actually interact with them. Um, and so the first pilot project that we did was a Signal DAO, which is a Moloch DAO contract in a telegram on Covan, and um, had some really uh, like strong results about how that increases participation for the DAO members. So I think the one really uh, interesting thread between all of you is that you've each chosen a different Web2 social channel to combine DAOs or smart contracts with. Um, you with Telegram, Facebook, and Fantastic 12 did Discord, right? So if each of you could maybe talk about why you've prioritized that Web2 integration um, with DAOs versus just simply creating, let's say, a DAO social network um, already on Ethereum. Maybe you start with Zephram. Mm -hmm. uh, um. 
Yeah, so the reason I made Fantastic 12 integrate with uh, Discord is that I see a lot of crypto community is on Discord, and I felt that, that um, uh, a lot of existing DAOs are not really uh, integrated with a social layer. Like, for instance, Aragon, like, Aragon DAOs, like, they don't really have, like, on their uh, native interface, there's really no like socialization involved. Um, so Discord seemed like a reasonable choice. Like the other candidates were Telegram and Slack, and uh, Telegram doesn't have channels. Uh, Slack is kind of trash. <laughs> um, so yeah, Discord is cool, you know. So that's why I started, and uh, I see, yeah, I think when DAOs are really, um, no, sorry, <laughs> a slightly out of breath. Um, when, like, I think a lot of, like, in past DAO experiments, a lot of what has gone wrong is that there is no deep integration like between the DAO, like smart contract and the operations and the, you know, what's actually going on between the people. So Fantastic 12 uh, is kind of trying to bring those really close together and make them almost indistinguishable. Like for instance, in Fantastic 12, like to do anything in the DAO is just like a bot command. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and then, oh right, so why, why the, the social interfaces? Why, why, why that specific? Instead of building a social app with a DAO on Web3. Oh, um, the main thing is um, it's much easier to, to bring people to existing, or bring tech to people on existing platforms than it is to bring people to new platforms. So as much as we can, reduce the amount of tech that they have to upload and install into their phone and also form a habit of going to that uh, new interface um, and instead build the functionality into their existing interfaces. I think that's, that's really the goal. Um, and we, yeah, we started with Telegram because it has a nice API for bot interactions to provide like buttons. Like that's, that's literally pretty much the, the main thing. It has buttons to, to select to hit commands. Yeah, I mean, um, I agree with the point that you, know, you, you can let people migrate. It's uh, super hard to let people migrate, and, and I was a journalist uh, covered uh, politics and you know um, how tech technology change international relationship and politics. You know, back in 2015, and uh, I, I did some study about Microsoft in 90s, and uh, Windows is a Windows Mac, Mac Windows is an evil software back then, and as I say this morning, you know Microsoft and Bill Gates is the you know evil king that time, like the Mark Zuckerberg right now. But I mean, it's not Linux um, beat him up. It's the Netscape Navigator, if you remember it. You know, they have a large lawsuit and um, DOJ v um, Microsoft. Because um, when you open a new world inside a closed world, you actually give them opportunity to create, an, uh, for the case of Microsoft, you, you give the user opportunity to go to another alter uh, alternative operating system inside the Windows. That is the broader. And everyone can build an app, which is a website back in the 90s using the browser technology. And now I think the same thing happens to the apps, happen to DAO. So I guess, well, it will probably uh, it will be like the same thing, like the, back in the 90s. So we don't, we don't want to build another app for social, another social network for the same reason. Um, I guess even though we tried, I mean, I, I know someone's trying, like Cedas and other great projects they're trying. I guess even they, they tried so hard, uh, the best outcome for them is still something very geeky, something very cool, like Linux. Um, maybe like something um, like Ubuntu. Ubuntu um, can be a good, um, you know, similar layer like Status, because Status is a layer on top of Ethereum. So I guess that's, the, um, that's their job. And since they're already doing their job, we should do something <coughs> different. Like we should do the broader, we should do the connector, uh, the bridge. Um, so I guess I pretty much agree with the, your point. But why Facebook and Twitter? Um, we start with Facebook first, because I guess Facebook won't, won't open up any API. Uh, I know that Discord has API, um, Rocket Chat has API, and Telegram has a perfect API, and I guess 
uh, these are our lines. Um, Facebook, they won't open up any API. They're like suing companies, uh, you know, doing third-party applications. So I guess if we start there and we prove that um, they can't shut us down, then all the developers we're going to follow. Um, if you want to trade off and want to do some centralized stuff, uh, you can use the API of Telegram, um, or of Twitter, of um, other social networks because they're like more friendly. So we tried um, for like uh, we spent like after one more than one year on that, and then uh, we launched in July the fourth. It's a good timing, last year, and um, in August I don't remember exact date. In August actually Facebook found out. Uh, I don't know why, but means they found they found out. And if you try use um, Messenger, Instagram, or Facebook app try to post mathful.com, it's actually banned. You can post that URL. So um, we, we don't care because we don't use the URL for a way to, um, to, dis, uh, you know, to spread the word. We can, you can, we can encrypt the message into a picture, into a meme, into a GIF, into an um, emoji stuff. So um, I guess that's why we want to try that, that part because I know there yeah. are other people trying the APIs work already, yeah. Hello? Okay. Um, so, so let's assume, because it's true, that, that it's really hard to move people from Web 2 to Web 3. I think everybody, that's kind of a, a common thread. Um, and assume that we're going to bring Web 3 tools to Facebook and, and Twitter, and we're going to allow them to launch DAOs, and we're going to allow them to raise funds and use DeFi from Web 2. What does that mean for, like, building a decentralized Facebook or a decentralized Twitter? Like, is that achievable? Can we actually get there if we just move to those platforms? Um, I think that's going to be incredibly difficult, but, well, the hope is that it will happen someday. Um, yeah, migrating someone from one social network to another is really difficult, like, we know that, but um, if you look at, like, other, like, kind of newer um, Web2 social platforms, you know, TikTok, uh, Snapchat, etc. Um, they also started with like no existing connections with like the big social networks of the day. So I think it's it's possible, it's doable. But in, I think for anyone who's trying to start this kind of new decentralized social network, they really have to well provide utility to the users beyond just being decentralized or autonomous or whatever like the user has to be able to feel the difference like they have to be able to like just and like if someone asked them why they switched to like a decentralized social platform they have to be able to give like an answer in one sentence and I don't think we have that kind of product yet yeah I guess um it's um if you want to do a whole new Facebook uh, decentralized is kind of impossible for the reason that uh, you can't scale to the to the you know 20, 20 billion or you know two billion people on, on the same software on the same platform. But if you take Facebook or take existing Web two as a backend, uh, that's doable. Uh, which which I mean, uh, what I mean is like even don't consider IPFS. They can handle two billion people as well. You know, just use them for um, um, temporary storage. For example, what we do is um, every single post on Facebook and Twitter is encrypted, but still it still re remains on Facebook. But you you have the cache, you have the whatever put in the peer-to-peer -peer database, and put to IPFS or whatever platform. And you know BitTorrent already proves that uh, even without the centralized servers, uh, they only have the tracker server. That's a small server. Uh, they already have you know two billion people onboarding in the early days of the internet, right? So I guess if you if you if you admit that you know they can never go away, you just use them as a backend, as their interface. Uh, then probably you can do that. And for um, for 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 bootstrapping a new social network, um, the large difference from right now and 2012, 2013, that is day from the TikTok and and Snapchat is. Um, uh, from what I know, because my wife she's a lawyer, uh, you know, TikTok is now having lawsuit with um, a, lot, a lot of social media, especially WeChat in China, that they use third party APIs to log in, and WeChat is suing them, stealing user data. It's not about WeChat really care about uh, user data. It's like, okay, use my social network, 
to uh, use the third-party OAuth to log in, and I want to sue you, I want to shut you down. And I guess it will put pretty much the same thing. Uh, the only thing we can rely on right now for a new social network is either email or um, cell phone number or uh, you know, a key, uh, key pair like DID. Uh, none of these three uh, works well, especially you know, right now it's a um, more diverse um, word and I, I don't expect you, know, you can do that like in 2012, 2013. So I guess the, um, the chance of starting a new, complete new social network is also over. But for the, for the reason people want to use a new social network or a different you know, decentralized social network on top of Facebook is quite you know, understandable. When we do the MakerDAO um, you know, campaign about the Chinese New Year red packet, I just called up a friend in the Middle East, like, oh, hey guys, just go to your Twitter and claim the red packet. You're on the sanction list, but you can now have the US dollar, right? So, um, I mean, that's a small use case. Um, only a few people is affected by the sanction list. But um, why, I mean, why, uh, I've considered it for many years that why WeChat and you know, uh, other social network have strong KYC, they can do the red packet. They can do the money transfer. It's major because of the, uh, the law enforcement regulatory, right? And um, for, even for Facebook, if they want to do something um, not even that decentralized, something like Libra, they will have a huge problem. So I guess they won't do that. And I also see that you know, Jack Dossie is endorsing the tipping. That's a tipping um, plugin for, the, for Bitcoin Lightning Network. So I guess even for payment on Twitter or even for the cross-border payment on Twitter and Facebook, uh, there's no way they can do it alone. There has to be a third party uh, pure decentralized on top of it, help them do it. And for forming a DAO, uh, like uh, what if I want to create a Facebook group and I'll add all my friends, like foreigner friends in a group and we come up with a DAO that have some stable coin um, locked up in the smart contract. And if you do something good, we want to uh, give you some, you know, um, com compensate or donation in people in the DAO. How do you do that without the decentralized layer? So I guess, if we solve the problem of the user experience, people will use that. I mean, uh, I guess uh, another speaker, um, Spec Chen, they already say that um, adult industry is also huge. And also, I want to point out that, okay, adult industry, um, if, you point some, if you post something like an image or like a GIF uh, that you want to charge people on, on Twitter, that is impossible right now. But without help, it's possible. I don't want to do that right now, but I, I'm saying that if you open up a new gate, new world, um, every developer they can just develop something interesting on top of the existing platform. And for now, I don't think they will stop us. And I, will think, I think there will be a large fight afterwards, after another five years. Yeah. Um, I, I think that like, inventing a decentralized Facebook, the main piece of that is um, allow, like, Facebook's a walled garden, that's where it makes its money. And the main thing about decentralized Facebook is having users be able to control their data and um, maybe probably profit from their own data or receive reward from their own data. The way that I think about that is it will take a long time because it's an educational process. Uh, Facebook's moat is its network and people come to applications I mean, they come to Facebook because of the network. There's, if there's billions of people on one application and one platform, it's going to be really hard for, to convince most of those people, 98% of them, to go to something else until all of their friends are also in that other thing. Um, the, the way that I think about a decentralized social network, though, and the thing that I think um, like what DAOOps will, will uh, aspire to be is a focal point um, that provides a unique identity between the number of the different networks where you can log in to your Facebook, Twitter, Telegram and have specific chat channels that then you can access the same account on the back end. And with that account, you can be connected to this, a specific DAO community. And, um, and from there, it's, you, know, you, could, you could have these interfaces that provide access to that actually decentralized piece of the social uh, uh, application that you're, that you're interested in utilizing.
So I want to switch gears a little and get out of the box of DAOs as organizations simply um, and think about it more as any decentralized community. Um, and we actually have a few of these that exist today in Web2 that use some kind of token, you know, things like TikTok, Twitch, you can, you know, earn rewards with tokens and whatnot. Um, but how do you guys see DAOs or this decentralized governance movement as different than existing communities online? Um, the main thing for me is that it's... Uh just empowering communities, so now they aren't only transferring data and memes and, and like chatting, but now they're also able to uh, coordinate around resources. So it's giving resources um, to communities um, and empowering them now to be able to control those resources in a, in a, in a, in a like leveraging the wisdom of the crowd, essentially. Um, but it's, it's, it's really about digital resources um, from my perspective. I guess, you know, um, as you say, like uh, Reddit also have their own like uh, token-like staff credit and Reddit is being famous for its anonymous and, you know, it's quite open social network, but um, they have to keep living, right? So take, they take investor money and that will force them to try to seek profit, even though they probably don't use a bad way. I mean, I guess for DAO is like, um, if you want to have some special functionality on, on Facebook and Twitter and something, you know, on Web3, on, on Web2 platform like Telegram, you can just write a boat yourself and you form DAO and that DAO actually, uh, all the members, they're kind of shareholders or they earn some reputation from that. And if I do a third party, um, you know, functionality for Twitter, like I, if I write a, wrote a third party uh, Twitter app, I won't get anything from Twitter uh, and won't even get donation from the open source community because they don't really care about that thing, right? And, uh, but I mean, let's say Mastodon. Mastodon is a decentralized Twitter, uh, Twitter-like um, software. If you really wrote, wrote a really good uh, client for Mastodon, they would like, have some large thank, thank you. And I guess the only thing they need probably is a DAO, but probably they don't. I just, tell, I just think the major difference is like, uh, the traditional internet giants or internet social apps, once they take the investors' money and they didn't figure out how to balance it, they're, they're, they're being struggling about the, the difference between users' interest and their shareholders' interest. And, and for, for Telegram, for Reddit, you can just build a DAO upon it. They're open and they're, uh, they're open to let you do it. And you're the shareholder of your DAO, yeah. Uh, for me, the biggest advantage of DAOs compared to like uh, say TikTok or stuff like that is its inter its ability to interoperate with other applications on the Ethereum network, specifically decentralized finance. Um, so if you just want to use DAOs for like just a friend group or whatever, I don't think that's going to be a very convincing uh, use case. I think the most convincing use case is to use DAOs to form uh, on completely online businesses and um, those businesses can you know interact with existing DeFi products you know they could trade on Uniswap take loans from compound etc and those you can like it's impossible to, to do with like reddit coin or whatever um, the other thing is that um, it's like for a business environment for an economy to thrive, you really need like a f free environment where you know there's as little um, regulation as possible, uh, and um, Ethereum pro provides that. Like it, for a DAO, like you can do whatever you want on the Ethereum network. Like no one's gonna come and knock on, on your door and say, "Hey, don't do that with my DAP," you know. Um, so yeah, I kind of foresee a future maybe in 10 years, maybe 15 years where like there's going to be like hundreds, maybe thousands of completely remote uh, crypto native businesses running through uh, DAO frameworks and they're going to be able to do some wonderful things with DeFi. Um. For both of you, Zephyrm and Siju, um, I, I know that James, you're working on bots with with a bridge, but um, I'm not aware that y you guys are working on bots. What, what are your thoughts on bots in in the Ethereum space and and to improve the user experience? And James, feel free to chime in as well. But 
Um, yeah, so Fantasia 12 is like the front end is basically a Discord bot, right? right. Yeah, <laughs> that answered your question. Um, yeah, um, for Fantasia 12, like the biggest, I think, UX challenge is just kind of how clunky it is because it's not like directly integrated with Discord itself. Um, so like, for instance, if you want to like submit a transaction, you kind of have to click on a link that a bot gives you and it takes you out to a browser where you can connect to MetaMask or Fertmatic, stuff like that. Um, and that's, that's kind of clunky, it kind of works. Um, the other thing for bots is like, it's basically a command line interface. Like, you don't really want like normal users to learn to use command line interfaces, right? Um, I guess the situation is better with like Telegram uh, because you have actual buttons to use. Um, for Discord, it's just command line. Um, that's a bit of a challenge, and uh, you kind of had to really explain well to users like how everything works, and yeah. Yeah, I guess um, we don't use bot right now, uh, but it's doable and we have planned on doing that. But I mean, the bot is separate from the decentralized layer, which means like you guys, the bot don't hold any asset. Uh, the bot definitely run on a server or you know some kind of database, but you know it's just an account on Facebook, on Twitter, or maybe Discord, Telegram. So um, what, how, how we handle the user experience problem is we actually, um, uh, you know, Twitter can have the third-party application, and we tried uh, we tried to support one third-party application called Twitter, uh, T W I D E R E um, on Android. Uh, they also kind of um, got some fans because they also support Mastodon uh, within the same app. Uh, then we also try to support other Twitter uh, third-party application. I guess um, not until Jack Dorsey uh, announced uh, the the thing about the blue sky about decentralized Twitter in in last year, uh, probably we are the only ones doing that, even though we don't really address them out, because I think that's very important, because um, I, I think, you know, either Twitter will completely close up the API, or they will probably open up, like Mastodon, or in the middle, you know, in somewhere in the middle. Uh, no matter what is the situation, uh, you can use a bot for interface, and you can use a third-party application for better user experience, and you can integrate the MetaMask or Ethereum wallet inside the uh, the third party application. That's that's how we did that on the mobile on the mobile phone. Uh, now the Facebook one, they don't have any API, so we pretend it's a browser and we inject JavaScript code in. Uh, for Twitter, it's better. So I guess um, for the bot in the Web three in the Web two, it can be a good bridge, but um, I guess. I mean, it, it really depends on the network, on the on the social network itself, on, on IM itself, to get better using user experience. Yeah, because we have less trouble with Twitter these days after the announcement. They're stopping um, dealing with the API hacking problems. You know, kind of. So, you know, uh, some some Twitter third party API they actually completely delete all your ads. Now Twitter is fine with that. Uh, before the announcement, I guess they're super pissed off when you do that. Um, so I guess there's a lot of things you can do, especially, you know, try to, try to, we try to just learn all the third party APIs for all the social networks, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, excited about viral Twitter bots. So next thing. <laughs> Aside from social networks and bots um, and even encrypted messages, what do you guys think are the missing tools to actually proliferate DAOs um, either to Web2 organizations like a Facebook or just to get non-crypto devs thinking about how they can use DAOs or like the underlying mechanisms. Um, so what toolkits are missing at, the, at this moment? Um, the toolkit for the developers or for the users that want to create these like systems or either. maybe both? Okay. Um, the way that, uh, that we've been thinking about it is, is um, so we have uh, a a like toolkit for developers that makes it really easy to kind of build bot applications and and general applications, but specifically we've been building bots thus far. Um, 
we want to create flows that are standardized for anyone to kind of come in and interact with the DAO because there's only a couple sort of patterns that you need in order to communicate effectively with these, this DAO tech. It's mainly push notifications for proposals, um, links that you can quickly access the, a voting interface for those proposals, and then um, like token permission chat rooms. That's kind of the main pieces that I see as, as being necessary. And so uh, the platform that we are, we are going to like continue building out and creating is something that has these templatized flows that you can then insert APIs and contract keys um, into the uh, into the flow to create a unique system for your um, for your DAO or your your community, um, and that way it's it's more interoperable, um, and that that's kind of like the toolkit both for the DAO admin, and then um, if you want to get a little dirtier, you can get underneath and like play with the actual like uh, low code environment that we're building this in. Yeah, I guess um, it's not really about bot; it's really about um how to deal with this, like the censorship with the store, because um, you know um, even Brave, like they have like um, I guess they have 10 million users right by now, and Opera has like they claim they have like 100 million users. They're using the Chrome extension store, and Chrome for now, Google for now don't have any problem with crypto people, right? But um, as we remembered um, two months ago, MetaMask had the issue with the Google Play Store, and I guess even people in the crypto. Who care about the autonomous? Who care about the you know the free software? Don't really use free joint. They don't don't really use the F joint, and there's no way on iOS. Uh, you know, back in several years ago, there's something called um, workflow. It's, uh, that that by that time it's third party app, but they're merged by Apple. So I guess there's no uh, way to deal with that on the iOS. Um, I'm pretty worried that you know uh, you can have a super good hack on the Telegram app. And then you can integrate all the CRM good good part on it, and then uh, Telegram is fine with that. They don't really care about it, and all the fans of the crypto world is really like it. And then Apple say no, because it's super um, it's super cool. You know, the user experience is too good to be true. And then uh, I mean, you got both API, and soon you know, if I'm Amazon, I can open a bot um, Telegram, and I can send or and I can sell digital you know books without using the in-app purchase. Which Apple takes thirty percent of the cut, so I can I can predict this thing will be happen in probably five years. For now, I think they just don't care because the user experience is really sucks. Um, but I, I, I we already did some experience that we, we have the we have a bot on Amazon that help you to buy a book use our credit card, and you pay me some die uh, on on Rocket Chat on Telegram whatever, and we just should actually buy the book and send it to your. Um, you know, mailbox or send it to your Telegram account, and you can read the PDF or read the ebook there. And that is, this is not allowed uh, based on the you know user agreement and TOS for App Store, for Chrome Store, for um, Google Play. I guess once the user experience is better, once there's more user, this is a huge problem. Yeah, I guess so. More people building DAW, uh, more, more people building easy to use bot. Uh, it's kind of jeopardized the, the Ethereum world, uh, the entry point between the traditional world and the Ethereum, you know, crypto world. Yeah, that's the thing I'm worried about. Yeah. Um, on the crypto developer side, I don't think there's any important missing piece. Like, like if it was like two years ago, then you could say that we don't really have like good developer tools for like debugging and stuff, but. Today, like we, I think we have like really good tools for that. Like, uh, Brid, uh, sorry, Bridler Dev, like that lets, that's like a truffle replacement that lets you like, uh, debug your um, smart contracts really easily. Uh, there's also Tenderly that lets you like debug your uh, transactions um, to see what's wrong. Um, I think what's really missing are two things like one is for um one is a really good onboarding flow for like just completely new users to the crypto world you know getting their first eth something like that um we're we've definitely made progress with tools like formatic uh portis um etc um but i don't think they're 
good enough yet for just onboarding someone who just, you know, some random person off the street, hey, join my, like, sign up for Firmatic. Like, they'd be like, why? You know? Uh, and that kind of goes to my second point. Like, there is really no huge incentive for just a normal person to be onboarded <laughs> into this crypto world. Like, you know, sure, like, we have decentralized finance, which is, you know, a bunch of cool stuff. You can, like, lend out your uh, die to earn, like, pretty good interest. But other than that, like, there's, like, because of how much friction still exists on in the onboarding flows um for normal users they don't really see much of a point to onboard uh and i think that's a huge problem all right um who here is familiar with uh, signal dao or tried it wow. okay pretty cool um i had a question so I guess this is just an observation I've had from, from using it. Um, how, do you, how are you going to deal with kind of the attention of people with bots? Because um, I find that, you know, just using SignalDAO, I mean, it, it kind of requires your attention. And, and like, how do you deal with that if there's like five, six different DAOs? Is it scalable? I think that's a really good question. And because at scale, you'd have a signal DAO, a Moloch DAO, a Banner Cartel DAO, whatever DAOs you're a part of, and then you have this whole, like, Telegram's already noisy, and then you have bots that are on top of that spitting noise at you in another whole, like, another level of way, and so I, that's a really good question, and the solution to that would definitely emerge as things continue developing. Um, for a while, I imagine it'll, you just have to kind of, like, go through the noise, and you have to know what to listen to, whether it's um, your Telegram or maybe your following. So one, one thing you could do is um, we can push notifications through Twitter, and then you could also follow that Twitter through your SMS. And if you receive a notification that, hey, your, this proposal has happened through your SMS because it got pushed through Twitter, um, that might be less noisy because I'm not, I'm not getting spammed as much on, on my phone, my text message as I am on Telegram, for instance. And so, I mean, finding those kinds of workarounds could be a, a solution to, to reducing that noise. I'd love to switch gears a little and dive in more to the specific use cases you guys are focusing on with DAOs. Um, and maybe start with Zephram, because yours is sort of the farthest removed from this group. Um, and so for anyone that doesn't know, Zephram is working on B-Token Fund, which is essentially a hedge fund DAO. Um, and I'd love for you to talk more about that and how you've seen it grow or the community evolve versus other DAOs like a Meta Cartel or Moloch that are much more community focused and most people actually know each other. Mm. Yeah, so first, a bit of introduction to Btoken. Btoken is, um, in a word, a crypto hedge fund. Um, what's cool about it is, one, it's open to anyone. Anyone could onboard as a fund manager, and anyone could onboard as an investor. Um, the other cool thing is that um, we use a meritocratic system to redistribute um, control over the fund across the manager. So for instance, um, if you're, you've performed really good in the past few months, then uh, you would really quickly accrue uh, control over the, uh, the token funds treasury. And you'll be able to use more money to invest in various cryptocurrencies and crypto derivatives. Um, and to compare the community building with um, say Meta Cartel and uh, Moloch. Um, let me think. Yeah. Hmm. I guess yeah. the the thing I'd like to focus on is like a lot of the DAOs we now know of, Meta Cartel, Moloch. It's a lot of people who are in this room, and we either know each other, and we don't even necessarily need the DAO. But your use case is one where actually everyone's quite anonymous, and they might yeah. not even be part of their own communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing, like. We've spent a lot of effort on actually trying to build up this community, uh, both for our managers and for investor, investors. Uh, we mainly use Telegram to do that, and what we're seeing is that our managers are really, you know, talking to each, each other about their experiences and, you know, um, just giving each other help. 
And I think that the main reason for this is how the token is set up. Like, in, instead of something like uh, the set social trader uh, dApp, um, where each where each person is their own manages their own fund, uh, in the token you have all these m different managers managing a single fund, so they have like a common purpose, and that's kind of the center for why. Uh, they would want to, why our community members would want to collaborate with each other and help each other. Um, yeah, I, I would say that the, to the Batoken community is fairly similar actually to Metacarta and Moloch communities, like even though like they don't really know each other, like you know, you kind of know someone who, like some random guy who you've chatted with on Telegram or Twitter, you know, you kind of know them by their like icon and like, uh, online name, and I'm. I don't think that um, the anonymity part is really hindering the community building. Um, and the questions about the dynamics between a community that knows it's each other versus like an anonymous DAO that's just based that's online, to, yeah. right? <laughs> I think it's interesting. I don't know because um, I haven't experienced many anonymous DAO communities. Um, I'm I'm actually really curious about how the original DAO kind of came and like condensed as a community. Like, to what ex what number of people in that DAO were um, a, a collective of individuals who knew each other face to face or online versus heard about it and bought into the token sale? Um, because that would have been a like more anonymous at least than like some of the smaller communities that you see today. Um, yeah, and like, do, do you think you need face-to-face -face interaction for these communities to thrive? Mm. I think, um, I don't know about face-to-face -face interaction, but uh, communication is, is the key. Uh, DAOs aren't a technical problem, they're a human coordination problem. And I do think that chat rooms and some sort of synchronous and asynchronous communication um, methods for these DAOs to uh, state their purpose, et cetera, is, is critical. Yeah, it kind of sounds like this idea of decentralized governance, like our vision of uniting these world of strangers isn't the reality because to your point, Zephram, like when people join a community, they do end up coming together somehow. And so this like abstracted layer of smart contracts isn't going to keep people from coordinating on these other off-chain platforms to actually make more uh, like less anonymous communities basically. Yeah. So we have like... Should we, should we take some questions from the audience? Wait, I want a quick one. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe in like two sentences, or maybe three. Just keep it really short. What do you imagine the future looks like, like five years from now, in, in like bots and DAOs and communities, Facebook? Um, for me, it's just crypto-based com community and businesses. That, that is the future. Bis crypto businesses interacting with DeFi, interacting with each other. Uh, and selling their products directly through crypto-based platforms. Um, I think everyone can use the Web3 feature um, within the current web, no matter it's Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, whatever. I think that's definitely achievable in five years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm imagining um, influencer nation states. I think that the line is actually going to blur um, I think like we have to use these words to define mechanisms because we're still building things and naturally we need nomenclature. But I think that a DAO is just going to be some kind of decentralized voting feature of every single application. Like Suji, like you mentioned, like Excel spreadsheets. If we could start making actual decisions directly from the Excel spreadsheet instead of sending the model through email to then do a, a conference call, like that would solve so many problems. Um, so that's, that's my vision ultimately for the DAOs. Yeah. Do you want to take some questions? Yeah, 
No, I think I mean that's super possible, especially if like it. I like it depends on how uh, like the the risk involved with the vote. If the vote is going to allocate a million dollars to something, that's a pretty hefty decision. And if you're a part of that decision, then you should be really pretty well informed about it. Um, at the same time, if you're voting on that with like three people, then you should be extremely informed about that. If you're in, if you're with if you're voting on that with like ten thousand or a million people then it's, it's sort of the wisdom of the crowd then. And I don't know if you've, I, I like was studying the wisdom of the crowd because I was like a little um, uh, skeptical that it's actually effective. But if you, if you get a jar of jelly beans and we ask everyone at ETH Denver, how many jelly beans are in this, are in this jar? The number will come to like a percent of, of accuracy. It will, be, it, will be, it will be extremely accurate if you a aggregate the average number of all the guesses, while there will be extreme outliers on, on both ends. So I think if you leverage the wisdom of the crowd for large organizations, then um, quick voting on whatever risk profile could be okay. Um, another thing to that point that we, we didn't really touch much upon is, is the culture um, of a DAO. And I think that culture plays a huge role in building these communities. And I actually think that the, the long successful communities that, that are going to be staying around are the ones with strong culture because of that scaling problem. Uh, you know, if you scale a DAO to, I mean, even East Denver, right, th this entire event is going to be a DAO. We're going to be voting on it. There's no culture. So that's when you risk actually doing things that are bad is if there's no culture. Any other questions? I would actually <laughs> just, be, I have a, a quick thought because I think even you see today the people who are involved in DAOs are those go get them proactive people, but voting participation is still extremely low. Yeah, I guess the next thing we're probably going to do um, besides sending crypto over Twitter is like to, once you create a, a Facebook group, a WeChat group or a Twitter group, you automatically form, form a DAO, like we assign every people a DID. Maybe it's not on Ethereum, but it's um, definitely a compatible key pair. Then um, use like an emoji to vote, uh, whatever. And as that's doable, I think that's super lazy. It's just super easy to use. But um, I mean, as the same as the previous question said, I mean, I guess if you come to like decision about million dollar fund, um, it better it's more difficult for entry. But for now, I mean, the problem is uh, there's enough wealth in the, in the industry. There's enough people who have a lot of money, but there's not enough real general public user, like people who care about the daily life, but don't care about the uh, returns of their like, small money investment. There's lack of these people. So I guess it's super important to, to make it easy and lazy, even though um, it won't be able to make large decisions. But I mean, there's not so many large decisions to make in your life. Yeah. Um, so I guess, um, Yes, that's my answer, yeah. Um, I think you're going to really like Fantastic 12 because it was built upon the assumption that like, if you have a DAO with like, 100 or 1,000 people, like, people are just not going to participate or vote. So um, as the name suggests, Fantastic 12 kind of has this cap on the maximum member you can have in the DAO, which is 12. Um, of course, you can adjust that, but like, the whole system is designed around like just a small group of maybe friends uh, to collaborate through uh, a smart contract. And um, I think when you just have a smaller group, um, the, ish the issue of low participation kind of would evaporate because 
you know, your kind of friends, you have the, you, you would have this social layer to kind of, well, I guess it's just peer pressure, um, but yeah, like people are just gonna participate more in a smaller, uh, smaller group. I'd, I'd also add that, you know, the biggest DAO that we're all part of is the democratic process. Um, and making it easier to vote is definitely something we should be doing, even outside of blockchains. At the same time, we don't want people voting that have no idea um, about what's going on. And so in the context of DAOs about Web3 topics, like managing a protocol, we probably don't want to make it so easy that someone random can vote. Uh, but as DAOs become more proliferated in basic um, activities, then obviously we want more people to participate. So it's definitely more of a timing and a circumstance question. And the other thing I'd add is that Simplifying the number of actions that people take has been a step that we've seen in, in DAO stack. So both um, at the social consensus culture level, where you say, hey, we're only doing this, and then you enforce it, like you try. Um, I mean, Meta Cartel, you basically can submit a grant proposal or a new application. Um, we've seen DAOs on, on DAO stack where it's basically completely open. Uh, and it makes it way more complex to interact with because there's just too many, nobody really knows what to do. Uh, so like limiting the number of actions and then also, um, you know, doing that through social consensus or at the protocol level. Cool, thank Thanks, you. Yeah. Thank you.